Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, CDO Vision. This series is designed to give year-round education on data strategy topics in addition to our annual face-to-face -face CDO Vision event. We're already well underway planning for next year's event to be held in Atlanta, Georgia. This month, John and Kelly will be discussing big data strategies, organizational structure, and technology. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share with highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag CDOVision. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speakers for today. Well-known industry analyst Joan Lally is a business technology thought leader and recognized authority in all aspects of enterprise information management. With 30 years experience in planning, project management, improving IT organizations, and successful implementation of information systems. He is the President and Chief Delivery Officer at First San Francisco Partners. Also joining us is Kelly O'Neill. Kelly is the founder and CEO of First San Francisco Partners, having worked with the software and systems providers key to the formulation of enterprise information management. Kelly has played important roles in many of the groundbreaking initiatives that confirm the value of EIM to the enterprise. Recognizing an unmet need for clear guidance and advice on the intricacies of implement, implementing EIM solutions, she founded First San Francisco Partners in early 2007. You can meet both of them at the upcoming Dataversity Conference, Enterprise Dataversity, to be held in Chicago at the end of September. And with that, I will turn it over to John and Kelly to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Uh, Good morning. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. And, yeah. <laughs> or good evening, uh, be, depending on where you may be. Um, I'm obviously John, and that other person talking is Kelly. And uh, we're going to be talking about um, a big data update, or is it big data update, or an update on big data? It depends on where you put, I guess, the uh, emphasis on the syllables there. Um, then again, Big data is data, and it is, requires data management, and I think you'll see some things during our talk here today that uh, reinforces that we're taking a CDO's view of big data today, so we will not get extremely technical, but that is a point we will cover, is the technical nature of this area. Uh, but the fact remains that most CDOs, or many CDOs, uh, come into existence uh, because of the rise of analytics and its supporting technology, which we call uh, big data. Um, we've got some signs of success here. Uh, Kelly uh, uh, is the genius that created these uh, slides, um, and I see that she's muted, but I'd like her to unmute. And um, <laughs> because she's a lot younger than I and understands the modern music, um, here. So on the left, Kelly, that's a band, right? Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, one of the most successful things about big data is that it's so successful it has a band named after it, or rather a production company, I guess. Uh, but anyway, I think that that's one of the things that uh, always makes me laugh is that uh, big data is a band, as well as that is cool. a technology and a capability and all well, that stuff. But yeah, but, you know, that is cool. It is entered. Uh, so uh, we've both been doing this work for a while, um, some of us longer than others, but we've never seen data modeling enter pop culture, right? I've never seen a band called Data Modelers, right? <laughs> that would uh, be a little weird. Or do they play uh, DDW? Oh, never there, mind. well, that's true. That's that's <laughs> that's the jam. They don't, but they don't even call themselves data modelers. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but here you have something that has entered the mainstream, and that is pretty significant. Um, and then the other, now the other illustration which Kelly provided when we put this together was something more from my era. Good old Clara Peller, where's the beef? And 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 there are some challenges because even with all the hype. And this has been a super hyped area, right? Um, uh, uh, there's still some folks saying this really isn't delivering on the promise, uh, although I think uh, that would be um, uh, 
uh, maybe better in this area than others, but but we do we do have some some doubting uh, Thomases out there. Uh, and for those of you that are under the age of uh, 35, you're just going to have to uh, Google uh, Clara Pella and and Wendy's hamburgers. Uh, so why are we here uh, today? Well, Kelly and I are here to take a practical look at advanced analytics and big data. And just to set the semantics here, to us, big data is the enabling technology for, for advanced and sophisticated analytics. You can do advanced analytics without big data. Okay, big data being that volume, uh, velocity, veracity, what's the other one? Um, there's just a bunch of these around, around that thing. Um, uh, we want to talk about it because a lot of money is being spent and is, uh, there's talk that the return is not in uh, proportion to the amount being spent. And out of all this, we want to give you some practical advice because that's, after all, what we do on these conferences, on our little webinars here. Uh, and, uh, um, and we want to take that CDO strategic and the planning vision. Um, what's the fourth V, Kelly? Volatility. Thank you. Volatility. You think I of all people would know about volatility. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, you know, we're promised deeper insights. And uh, Kelly confirm, can confirm hearing this uh, with uh, our clients. No results yet. Um, uh, we've uh, got several clients in the last few years, right, that have invested a lot and haven't seen a whole month, whole, a great deal out of it. Um, and then, of course, hiring people to understand all of this has become uh, very, very uh, difficult. Uh, we also hear something like uh, the larger quantities of data dampen the errors, and therefore this data lake will produce stuff, but, we under, but what we get are some pretty familiar sounding things. They don't believe the result. They can't find anything. And what answer they do get, they don't know what it means. Um, and uh, um, so, uh, Kelly, anything to add to that? There, there, you know, the evidence that is, is there something going on here that, that we need to fix with big data? Anything else that you have uh, um, uh, uh, seen? Well, I think just to add some some color to those uh, those points, um, and one of the things that we did um, earlier, gosh, I think it might have been uh, last year, was a study around business intelligence analytics and predictive analytics, and a lot of big data falls into that predictive analytics category. And this is a data diversity research paper, if, if anyone remembers reading it. Um, but it was quite interesting in the sense that there was, you know, yes, there's a tremendous amount of investment and hype behind big data with uh, und indeterminate sort of insights, that the, that the insights that they're looking for are a little bit more of a needle in the haystack. And I do think that since then there has been a change, and we'll talk a little bit about what has changed and, and why people are starting to get uh, more insights. But one of the biggest challenges, is, as John's highlighted here, is that there's still a lack of skills on the market. And despite the emergence of study programs and university programs, still people are getting a large volume of the information that they have around big data from vendors and from the web. So it's less around practical knowledge and having been there and done that, um, which is what people are looking for when they hire people. So it's it's this uh, growth cycle that has, um, it, it, we're not into this place of uh, great resources on the market. I mean, we feel the same thing when we're looking for our own resources within our own company, that it's, it is hard to find people who have been there, done that, and learned the hard way, which is really important. So I just wanted to provide some more detail and color around that. Well, oh, which leads into this slide, John, if it's okay if I keep going. Please. That there's the current state of big data efforts is either extremely exhilarating for some or extremely exacerbating for others, exasperating, excuse me, for others. And uh, it's one of the reasons that this photo kind of captured it for me is it tends to be a younger, more, um, uh, I guess, um, uh, less jaded group of individuals that thinks that it's really exhilarating and so exciting. And it tends to be the older generation 
that tends to find it exasperating, frustrating, and not seeing the value. And so I think that one of the things that we need to consider as an industry is trying to tie those two worlds together because uh, the reality is that it's both. It's hugely exhilarating and great um, uh, opportunity, but at the same time overcoming some of those frustrations and continuing to move on and keep trying. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, some of the things we're seeing that are providing these challenges uh, to big data. And we're going back to the root cause uh, slide that we have used uh, on and off this year uh, because it is a result of some uh, good research among us and some of our peers, and we mentioned uh, those folks earlier, James Price, Tom Redmond, Annette McGillray, Doug Laney, uh, and Kelly and I. Um, uh, so from, from uh, we'll get into more details on these, but very quickly, the operating frameworks around big data and analytics uh, uh, in terms of governance and leadership are some areas we'll explore. Uh, the justification um, and how it's being used, uh, we're, we're, we will look at the uh, awareness and, and expectations around things, this whole business of, yes, we're going to be a data-driven organization. Uh, we've even had a client uh, in the last few years that said they were going to turn into a data company and, and then uh, proceeded to just have uh, no really good, clear vision what that really meant. Um, uh, then, of course, the alignment, uh, like Kelly uh, mentioned earlier, just, you know, conclusions and, and, you know, what do we want out of that? And then how do you enable this to move forward? So we're going to frame that in our root cause uh, type uh, uh, thing. And uh, if you need just a takeaway for the whole thing or you need to go right now and have lunch somewhere, uh, I think you can see that there's a lot uh, common to all of our enterprise information management, data governance type type of disciplines here. Uh, big data is not uh, uh, on its own in terms of, of, of some of the critical success factors. So first we're going to talk about organization and, and management and, 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 and the alignment type things. Uh, diving into our details a little bit more. Um, and uh, and um, I'll be talking about these, and Kelly will provide some commentary here along the way. Um, first of all, that operating framework, when we say no governance, inadequate leadership, the evidence here is the data lakes are becoming swamps. Um, we don't want to belabor this point. It's kind of all over the place already in the, in the big data literature, but, but gee whiz, you know, people just grab it and throw it in there and expect miracles. And, it isn't happening, it's, it, 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 or it requires someone who is so extremely trained to plow their way through the data that uh, um, you, you often wonder if there's a return on, on the results. Uh, if you're paying someone, you know, a, a real good, healthy six-figure salary, and they're coming up with five-figure benefits uh, off of their analysis, why are we doing this? Uh, and that gets you to the walk the data talk. If you're going to be data-driven, if you say you're going to understand what data does, you need to be willing to listen to that. There's, there, there are a lot of really good examples of where big data are helping companies, but in every one of those companies, when those numbers first came out and it said, company A, you know, a Cogswell Cogs, you need to go left and space these sprockets, you need to go right. The first thing those cultures did and said, we don't believe that number. All right, because sometimes the results are culturally counterintuitive um, and it's really hard to do that. Um, management is looking for miracles, uh, and they think it's the wrong answer, or they're looking for a one-off miracle. And, you know, this is like anything else. It takes some work to get there. Um, and the lack of awareness of what you can expect from that. Um, the cultural aspects of, of changing the way you actually make decisions uh, puts you into a, an, an immature situation very often, requiring you to define what a data-driven really, really mean. So in those three areas, Kelly, anything to add uh, to those? Um, you know, I think that, that, that some of this, and, and we will talk about this a little bit later in the slides, is this catch-22 around what we can accomplish and uh, what are the challenges. And so some of the challenges are based on pure lack of uh, um, 
systems and capabilities to accomplish it. For example, no no governance. So the, the governance around big data has always been a struggle because of lack of security in the platforms, lack of metadata in the platforms. And guess what? The good news is, is the technology providers recognize those gaps and they're building towards those right now. And so then what that also means is then as you know, data governance folks, we need to also adjust and recognize, so what is the metadata capabilities within big data and how do we apply our traditional policies, processes, and standards to those things that are relevant and meaningful within that uh, category as well. So I just wanted to say that there's uh, a lot of these issues are, are rapidly evolving because there is a lot of hype around this, and so therefore people are still paying attention to it. And uh, so it is rapidly evolving, and the, and the challenge of the CDO is looking at current state versus the in-flight rapid evolvement, and therefore also how does that sync up with the goals and expectations of the future state? Yeah, spot on, uh, spot on. Um, the, the business alignment aspect, um, miracle hunting versus solid direction. Yes, you hear about miracles, right? You hear about um, uh, organizations that found that little nugget. Uh, uh, but w where you're really seeing the real payoffs are organizations that uh, find some change in their customer touch points or an operational manifestation of their analysis. Uh, but they were looking for that. They had an intent to do that. They had a business strategy that required them to look in for a solution to achieve a strategy. So stuff isn't going to leap off and stick to your face. And I know it sounds strange, but we have actually witnessed companies that have spent a lot of money because they were told they needed to do analytics by somebody, and they've spent a lot of money, and they're waiting for some miracle to leap off. Um, but, but there's no air cover for the people to solve a business problem. Uh, the other thing you start to get into is folks get nervous about the costs and the results. And you get into that, it doesn't matter uh, what project, it's a very common symptom in our information world. At some point someone says, show me some value of this, I'm tired of waiting. And, and, and this is no, no lie, no fib, we've seen this, Kelly can corroborate it, uh, or else she'll just stay on mute and pretend I didn't say it. But um, uh, they end up doing production reporting or operational reports out of a uh, out of a eight figure invest capital investment in hardware and software uh, because now all of a sudden someone's nervous that they have to deliver something which is just taking it entirely the wrong uh, directions. And we've got a lot of common problems which we've kind of touched on and we'll just skip over the metadata part. But a lot of times if you throw all that data in there, it's still unsuitable for analytics, right? Um, it's just not there and no one can find anything uh, without extreme amounts of intimate knowledge with things. Um, and then there's the whole problem of everyone going out and buying their toys first and figuring out what they do with it. And this is becoming, uh, Kelly might even have to rein me in and reach through the phone and slap me, but this is becoming uh, a disease. Kelly, I, I don't know if we want to, we want to elaborate on that or not in this, in this world of big data, but buying the technology first and expecting the miracle is, is becoming um, almost uh, um, uh, uh, a theater of the absurd uh, with a lot of uh, folks that we get called in to help. Uh, I don't know if you have any more comments on this or the other parts of the slide. If not, I, we can plow ahead. Well, I think that I think one of the reasons, and, and there's always been this trend, especially being out in Silicon Valley, where there is hype around software uh, and technology capabilities. And so there's always the, uh, I'll, buy the, I'll buy the software and that will make all things better. And I think that that occurred in spades with big data, frankly, because nobody knew what else to do. And so they would buy the software and realize that, oh my gosh, I really don't have anything else to do with this you know, big Hadoop database, so I may as well use it as really cheap storage and show some value that way so that it's not seen as a throwaway. So I just think yeah. it's, it's, it's reflective of other trends and it just happened to be things yeah. people got so excited about that they did go out and buy the tools and then they, they reined it back a bit and are now reassessing what does this really mean to me and now that I already have this infrastructure, now I have a more intelligent way of taking advantage of it. 
Well, and we're going to talk now about at least organization-wise how to fix it. Uh, Kelly, this is something that uh, uh, we talked earlier about you walking us through that, and I'll provide the commentary. Sure. And so one of the things that, you know, obviously John and I have a perspective here around uh, the role of governance as being a conduit for business uh, goals, expectations, and drivers as it pertains to data. And so one of the things that we're seeing is that the alignment between that governance office and the analytics group, because we believe that big data is a, is a tool for an overarching analytics strategy, um, having that tight alignment is really one of the best ways to create the um, and, and ensure that there is the understanding of the data and the trust in the result, and also to identify the requirements that come uh, from the business side. So if we look at this model for just a minute, this is a, um, a sample model uh, that articulates how an analytics organization and a governance organization can work together and be synergistic. So in this organization, there was a role of the head of analytics, and the analytics in that organization was all kinds of uh, analysis except for uh, system, um, uh, operational and managerial reporting. So uh, the tools were not necessarily all big data. Some were traditional analytics tools, but it was all under the one umbrella of analytics, and they just identified the resources needed to solve the problem that they were looking to solve. A peer organization and the governance office, and that peer organization uh, worked quite closely with the analytics group, and the analytics group fed requirements into the data governance office, and the data governance office supported the analytics group and also fed requirements back in to analytics when they were seeing demand for certain sorts of data and uh, um, prioritization of data. Now, if we look kind of one step lower than the uh, business analytics and the data governance office, there's this whole community of people that execute on the um, governance guidelines and execute on the analytics guidelines. So whether they're direct reports or whether they're a virtual organization, I don't think really matters for the most part. But something to recognize is when you have the uh, lines of business represented in a governance organization, those participants, whether they're called data stewards, whether they're called business stewards, or whether they're just called data subject matter experts, many times they could be those same people that work within an analytics organization to uh, deliver analytics and uh, the outcomes of a big data environment uh, into the different lines of business. So uh, there's a lot of cross-pollinization that, that could occur between an analytics organization and a governance organization to ensure that the data is trusted so that it, the data, um, uh, that people believe the outcome of an analytics uh, exercise and a big data exercise so that there is the level of control to ensure that the data lake doesn't become the data swamp. And it becomes very synergistic because you've got this cross-pollinization. And you know the, the circle could even stretch a little bit wider in the sense that there's a data management group that supports um, from a technology perspective and the IT side in the same way that there's a data management group that supports the technology on the uh, data governance side. And as the tools develop more sophisticated in things like data quality and metadata and traceability and things like that, those roles will also become much more similar and much more synergistic. So, you know, one of the points I think that we want to provide as a takeaway from this um, webinar is that alignment between the traditional data organizations and, you know, these new sort of big data and analytics organizations to make sure that there is trust understanding and usage and consumption of the output of that data to make sure that the value is delivered. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, you know, so we've we spent, you know, first third of this talk talking about the problems, and I just want to reiterate, because we tend to be practical here, is that this is, uh, uh, this is not an org chart. 
but this shows a bunch of elements, right, Kelly, to help address some of these problems and root cause type things we, we've we talked about. Uh, one that I wanted to reemphasize was this enterprise infrastructure committee. Uh, mm -hmm. Infrastructure or enterprise architecture or oversight needs to be at the table. There is a tendency to have these uh, large big data, uh, you, know, you know, either it's outsourced, I'm not outsourced, uh, cloud, clouded, is that a word? It's clouded. Um, uh, Should be. Or, um, yeah, or, 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 or a, a business group goes off and acquires this or IT does it because they were told to do it. Um, and, infra and architecture infrastructures on the outside looking in. Um, it really behooves you in the long term, and we'll, we'll, we'll hit this one again here in the second half of our talk, is it really behooves you to not to do that. Um, that's where you get into a lot of alignment issues, a lot of contradiction issues, a lot of inability to find things, and uh, um, there's a lot happening with technology to, to uh, allow um, uh, to support that uh, the big data environment's not off on its own. And this tight alignment between the data governance office or, or, or operating model for data governance and then the operating or the engagement model of, of analytics, uh, really, really a powerful tool. Um, uh, you don't want them off on their own. When very symbolically, the last thing on this is we put the CDO at the top. The CDO, the top data job, could be the CIO in some organizations, but somebody has an eye on both legs, right? Somebody has has an awareness of what's of, of what's going on amongst all of these things, so we so we don't have a, a disconnect, uh, some accountability for that. And in some organizations, it's tightly aligned, where this could look more like an org an organizational chart. But in some exactly. organizations, analytics doesn't report up through the chief data officer, hence the requirement for the virtual virtual um, uh, working together in collaboration. Right, and I think you know the evidence is strong that organizations where the CDO or the top data job or the CIO has been left outside looking in at a big data effort, uh, and you have seen less than sterling successes uh, in, in a lot of those. Um, uh, awesome, very good. Just a reminder here before we move on, we do love answering questions. Uh, if you hear anything uh, that you disagree with or uh, want to have clarified or expanded upon, um, or, or you know, just, just, just wanna talk, then please send us a question and we will be happy uh, to answer that question, enter it in the question part and uh, uh, I will uh, make sure we answer that. Um, let's move on now to the technology. We, we had talked about uh, of kind of a visit of the state of the art, and um, uh, it, it is important. Uh, I know Kelly will agree with you that I'm not the, I, I tend to put the technology second, and why are we doing this and what for first? Um, uh, we kind of do our work that way uh, at First San Francisco. But um, we do need to talk about it because, my goodness, it is, it is changing and there's some really cool things going on. Um, this little company called First Mark, the, this, um, uh, again, uh, uh, Kelly, we talked about uh, big data being a rock band or, or a media company. I saw this, the first time I saw this graphic was on um, uh, social media. Uh, and it was on somebody's Facebook page that is on it and said, look at the cool picture I found. So, so I mean, wow, you know, uh, so I went and, and dug this up. This is the universe of technology now. Um, so I, I guess my first thought is if you're going to go out and buy something, where are you going to start without a plan? Good heavens. Uh, this is easy. If you can, if you uh, down there on the bottom, you see first marker, you can just go to Big Data Landscape 16 and Google that. You can go find a nice big picture. It's a lovely little site. It's a couple of really smart people that are keeping abreast of things. But holy cow! Um, obviously, there's a lot of money running around in here. And and and, uh, but where do you start? Right? You you need to have a little bit more um, uh, idea of your scenario. And, and that's kind of how we're going to frame the technology and the technology changes here are around some various scenarios. So uh, things are, are, are evolving. 
Um, the first big change I think that you really need to be aware of, oh, no matter where you are around big data, and, and head towards this, by the way, is this technical versus business conversation. Um, uh, uh, I, w I will admit, uh, oh, about five or six years ago, to being um, dubious about big data, um, uh, and, 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 you know, I was, there was a part of me that was like, it's going to be like knowledge management was, it's going to sound really cool, or artificial intelligence, and then it's going to kind of disappear into the, into, the, into the woods there for a while. Now, that didn't happen. Um, uh, but what did happen is it became an extremely technical thing. Um, if you look on uh, um, any of the uh, blog uh, type uh, social medias like the Tumblrs and, and things like that, and you, and you talk about people that are engaged in this, they're all highly, highly technical. And it is, to a sense, isolated, a really cool solution from the people that can use the solution. So the market is driving very rapidly towards simpler terms easier explanation of things. You don't need to know a whole bunch of acronyms that you do, don't understand uh, to, un, to, 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 to use the tools. Uh, an outshot of that is the return to known uh, access methods. So SQL, whether you're a NoSQL fan or not, a lot of people know SQL. That's how they like to look at data. Everyone has a row and column mindset. Um, there's, there's, you know, most business analysts view the world as a spreadsheet. Okay, so um, those connectors, those types of connectors to common tools that they are familiar with and SQL will more and more dominating as well as, well as just um, uh, uh, putting the data in a proper uh, place. Um, you're going to start uh, the concept of the data pond, a subset of the data lake where the data is, 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 more, is treated so that it is more consumable by more people other than a data scientist, you're going to see a lot of that. And rather than doing a report just to prove you got something out of this pile of data, you also are going to see, especially around Internet of Things, a lot more mission critical uh, managerial operational type things where you're driving the numerical, we used to call it, you know, real time analytics, right? So you're driving uh, the conclusion, but we're, more and more of this is becoming real, and it's going to just keep happening. Um, old data warehouse isn't going away. Um, it's being integrated into this. In other words, uh, if someone finds it easier to, to use uh, an analytic or an algorithmic type thing to create a data set that is useful on an operational basis, then that's getting put into a traditional row and column ODS or a traditional row and column data warehouse. That's fine. Find the right spot for the data. It's not necessarily old and new. It, you know, there's this talk of the data warehouse is dead. Is is not is is uh, it, it's a euphemism for change. Um, but there's always going to be the need for a static historic data source, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, uh, uh, but the conversation is changing. Uh, but we're we're not getting rid of the old. Um, and uh, what I'll do is I'll cover the next one, and then I'll bring Kelly in here for any, any comments on, uh, on the next one. Uh, we also now have, uh, believe it or not, because we measure all of this in dog's years, uh, um, where one year of tech is seven years of, 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 uh, of normal human progress, it seems. Um, you're starting to see a look at, well, that's old, old technology. Um, uh, and a lot of uh, your original Hadoop uh, lakes and things like that are getting re-architected and restructured. And so our advice to you is don't back away from that. Uh, performance, you know, some of the stuff is slow, and there's ways to speed it up now. Uh, so, you know, embrace that. Uh, integrate it into the rest of your enterprise architecture. The big data uh, uh, analytics uh, cluster of, of technology should not be a one-off isolated bundle of stuff that uh, a bunch of data scientists use. It is an integral part of your information asset portfolio needs to be treated as such. Uh, now, that, so the old's out, what about the new big? Well, you know, Spark is taken over as even, even a substitute for Hadoop in some areas, but certainly the go-to supplement wrap around, the way to get to it, et cetera, et cetera. 
there. Again, I mentioned SQL earlier. NoSQL storming more and more and more all the time. Uh, use of semantic web technologies, use of um, uh, graph databases that are wrapped around or fed from uh, these structures. Awesome, awesome, powerful, powerful stuff. That's why, again, you've got to work this all into your enterprise architecture, because this stuff can, if it's woven together the right way, can be really, really powerful. One area that I'm going to elaborate on uh, is the cost of ownership. Uh, Kelly mentioned that everyone went after Hadoop because I can put all this stuff in there and I don't have to spend the money organizing it and we can put so much stuff in it we can't even imagine how much stuff it is. But you know what? We are hitting cost constraints now. In the last couple of years, the organization said, I, you know, even if it's in the cloud and someone else is doing it, it's still starting to cost me an awful lot of money. You know, even if it is only pennies per, per terabyte, if I have all these terabytes and I'm hammering all the time and it's always changing and I have to pay someone and take care of this, it's getting expensive. Now add to that the cost of scarce labor. You know, you're talking some pretty healthy salaries. So um, those are uh, um, uh, um, the, um, uh, I'm sorry, a bunch of questions just popped in and it totally distracted me. I apologize for that. Um, there's a lot of, uh, cool pictures out there on these uh, um, uh, server installations that are next to a river because that's the only way you can get enough water to cool off the servers. It is, the scale of this stuff is incredible, and it doesn't matter how cheap it is per byte or per gig or whatever, when you add up all those numbers, it gets really, really, really inexpensive. Add in some expensive labor, add in uh, some training costs, add in uh, um, uh, the cultural impact. This is expensive and it's being seen. It is not going unnoticed in, in the executive suite. And you're gonna to start to see in the next year, and we strongly advise our clients uh, in the analytics world to start to look at cost of ownership and start to say, where should we put this data so it is used the best way? And that means, best means a lot of things, but one of the aspects of best is the most economical and efficient way to do it. If we need to get it out of a hard to find type thing where I need a scientist to do it all the time and put it into something a bit more mechanical like a warehouse, well then by gosh, we're gonna do that and, and, and go from there. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the next thing is wrapped mostly around the internet of things. Um, that's the, the um, uh, we're working on uh, something like that now and uh, can, Kelly can maybe chime in on that one, but um, Everyone knows Internet of Things is kind of the next cool thing or the next uh, uh, um, uh, permutation of this area. Uh, we're well into it now. I'm not so sure I want my refrigerator telling me or telling anybody else what I'm doing, but, you know, that's kind of where we're headed. Um, of course, that makes privacy a big thing, too. But what we're seeing here, these are, these are not business events. Uh, me opening the refrigerator and taking something out of the freezer that weighs about five pounds, and so the refrigerator says, whoa, John's defrosting a turkey or defrosting a roast or something like that. Fine. That's not a business event that I want to keep. That, the, 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 the relevance of that data is not persistent. Um, so there's a lot of churn in these databases. And what we're seeing is the mindset of leaving stuff out there, and it's totally irrelevant because uh, you're using the stuff to tweak customers, reach out to consumers, adjust touch points in your customer life cycles, all this kind of stuff. It's, it's not, it, it, the data is no good after a month or six months or something like that. The data erodes and its half-life is really, really short. Um, and so you need to adjust uh, to that. We thought an operational data store at one time was, was, was hairy and scary. Then real time a BI was hairy and scary. Now we're getting into you know, petabytes and exabytes of data that are churning and turning themselves over maybe, you know, dozens of times a year. Uh, that has a lot of uh, technology considerations too. I'm gonna stop on my, my tirade on the technology here and I'll turn it over to Kelly for her, for her contribution uh, to our um, uh, uh, technology uh, things. Let's see, is she unmuting? There she goes, hello Kelly, welcome back. <laughs> sure. Yeah, you know, I think it's really just about as we learn 
understanding what's fit for purpose and, and, and what's best to be used for these different things. And part of what um, we go through, which is a positive thing, is, is the learning process of what works, what doesn't work, what is a good um, cost of ownership, what is it really valuable to be used for. And, you know, ideally we're scaling fast, right? And so that we are learning in a very quick way that it doesn't make sense to throw out the data warehouse. What makes sense is to throw is to use the data warehouse for the typical sort of, you know, um, descriptive and diagnostic sorts of uh, analytics, if we take kind of the, the Gartner approach of descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. Sorry, I couldn't get that word out. Um, you know, there's there's reasons for maintaining some of the uh, quote unquote old technologies as we look towards predictive and prescriptive and leveraging some of the high volume uh, processing to look for some of those needles in the haystack, which prescriptive uh, might be more aligned to because we don't know necessarily what we're looking for. So again, just going back to uh, leveraging the technologies that are best suited for that purpose and um, I guess dealing with executive expectations to ensure that there is enough of an understanding that you don't just do big data, that you actually have a purpose behind what you're trying to accomplish with big data, rather than just doing it because somebody came back from a uh, conference and, and that's what is on everybody else's agenda, so it should be on mine as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we threw in a reference architecture. We had this uh, um, uh, actually, we went and just up, up, we update this once or twice a year, uh, and uh, this little presentation was a good reason to to go back and and visit it, visited it, visit it. Um, uh, and, and Kelly and I can uh, we'll, we'll walk through this. And I do see questions coming in, and uh, I also see some really cool editorial comments, which I will cover uh, those. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, and and we, we will we will we'll cover those. Um, let's see here um, sources in the reference architecture. We have structured sources internal and don't forget external. A lot of organizations are buying data and they want to throw this all in there as well. And uh, even if you have uh, a, a data lake or some similar big data construct, and you have your internal uh, business events, et cetera, and you go external from somebody, those data models never line up. Uh, that problem has never gone away. It never will. Um, uh, and and uh, the analytics are difficult to do without some reconciliation. I, uh, um, uh, kind of invented a term here, var variable structure. Internet of Things um, uh, could be considered structured, it could be considered unstructured or, 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 or minimal structure. The fact is that a lot of the sources that are coming in are from so many protocols and so many types of, uh, of, of latencies in this area that you're, it is a discipline in itself. I, I, and that's my opinion. We can certainly argue with me on that one, but that's my opinion. Then we have semi-structured, and here we go with the initials XML and JSON, uh, um, that type of, of uh, source. Uh, and then the unstructured, which, you know, click streams, uh, PDFs, uh, consumer sentiment surveys, those kinds of things. Acquisition-wise, besides the typical staging of the semi-structured and unstructured, one thing we cannot overlook now is the streaming. This is very quick data, it has very short half-life. Uh, it is streaming, it is here, it is gone. It's like a little data firefly. Um, I don't mean to be that poetic, but um, that's really kind of what it is. And that is a separate type of acquisition and handling process. The management, what we had last year was cleanse, enrich, transform, create, the golden record. Uh, you, you probably would like to have some master data, reference data to bounce these things off, to have good dimensions. But one, the management area, the thing we've added now in 16 is total cost of ownership. It can be burdensome, it can, it can hurt. And uh, so it needs to be brought to light in the management of these things. In addition to our uh, persistent stores of the traditional warehouse, the ODS, the Data Mart, uh, we have Hadoop. We have also Data Lakes, 
and ponds uh, uh, perhaps within your, your, your structure. And we also have Spark now from a reference architecture as something that can be standalone in lieu of Hadoop or in and supplement to uh, Hadoop. There's a lot of other technologies on the way too. I'm not going to get into them just out of the interest of time today. It's worth research, but you know, I like that chart we showed. There's an awful lot on there. In terms of delivery of analytics, uh, we have added beside other data retrieval emphasis on there is SQL or NoSQL type uh, access and delivery to these, and also staging of these in NoSQL type data stores like a graph database, like we mentioned. Uh, or maybe a more traditional SQL thing, but being more useful at a touch point like mobile BI or, or something like that. So, so the reference architecture is changing, it's evolving. Um, uh, Kelly, anything to chime in on, on our reference architecture here? No, except just a shout out to one of our consultants, Samra Saliman, who helped us with the 1.0 version of this. So this is based on that original slide that she uh, kind of crafted for us. Uh, very good. Thank you very much. The other thing I did was I noticed I made data governance really thick and big and really stand out, folks, because you've got to really wrap some governance around this or, or you're not getting uh, very, very effective. So uh, on that, we'll just move on here to just kind of a wrap-up, and Kelly and I will, will do a bit of a wrap-up here on this slide, and then we'll move on to the questions and, and answers. And once again, folks, uh, we have, uh, it looks like enough questions for about uh, 10 minutes, so there's room for more questions. So please, please, please ask us uh, questions. This is your chance to get uh, um, uh, insight uh, and uh, cool stuff, and, and please take advantage of it. Um, uh, Resource-wise, uh, Kelly, let's just bang through these together here. Um, we talked about skill resources. But we also talked about that operating frameworks where we've got to interact with, interact with the other elements of enterprise information management. We don't want to be standalone, right? Absolutely, absolutely. It is a collaborative approach in order to make sure that it is an end-to-end -end, uh, trustworthy exercise. Good. Um, on the alignment side, the descriptive business intelligence isn't going away. Uh, uh, the, the Gartner Group way of looking at it is kind of a, a cool way to look at it, and Descriptive BI is here, to, it's here forever. Um, a lot of clients confuse analytics and BI, especially folks that aren't immersed in the business as, say, those of you, you listening or, or Kelly or I or our, our folks working with us or other companies too. They, they, to them, it's just a way to get to an answer, right, Kelly? They, there, there is no discrimination between them. That's right, that's right. Yeah, and, 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 and to treat it as something special and use big fancy words and initials is really doing your, your peers and your organization a disservice. Um, uh, um, I don't want to sound harsh about it, but you can come off uh, uh, arrogant, as, a, as, as, as arrogant, not intending to be, but as, as an old fashioned technologist and being arrogant with technology and really not help your cause at all. Uh, in, 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 the, in the data management world. Uh, we also need explicitly value, right? The answer is not going to leap out. Let's have a problem to solve. Let's have at least a business goal or strategy that we try to support, uh, something, something like that. But Kelly, um, you know, the, 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 uh, um, this almost smacks of, of the early 90s build it and they will come. Maybe not so much that, but we got to be careful of that, right? Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. Because guess what? There's going to be a new thing that's all hyped up within the next seven years, for sure. <laughs> and then this will become old. So. Oh, and I, you, and then you can have send me the invite to the webinar you're doing. I'll be glad to listen. <laughs> um, outcome uh, uh, optimization across descriptive and predictive. We need to do the most efficient thing where it needs to be. To be done. There is not one blanket answer. There's no one blanket bucket. Folks, I'm sorry. There's no miracle where you can just dump everything and the answers pop out like frogs out of a bucket. Okay, it's not going to happen. You've got to work with your enterprise architects. You've got to, 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 you know, you, you got to engineer this stuff. All right. I, 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 uh, anything on that one, Kelly, before we move on here to questions? 
You got it. I got it. All right. All right. Um, let's talk about, let's do some questions here. First question. Um, um, I, you know, I always want to do like, this is from, this is from Fred in Cleveland, and, and, but I don't know where any of these people are from, so I can't say that. Anyway, uh, this, this uh, particular listener recently attended the MIT CDO conference. Much talk about data, 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 data. Very little talk about the actual systems that produce the data. The data just doesn't appear. It comes from systems. What gives? Well, you know what you're hearing there, and um, I've never been to that particular conference. Uh, um, I don't know what their emphasis is. But, you know, this is kind of what we talked about earlier, right, Kelly? This emphasis on technology and the tools, this goes back to the old days of the BI vendors mm -hmm. saying, yes, we can get you these reports in 30 days. Just mm -hmm. do this and slice and dice and all this. And then someone says, yeah, but how does the data get in there? And we go, well, we don't do that. We don't do that. Um, so, so, no, it doesn't just appear, does it? it that's our reference architecture has sources on it. That's why it's a lot of work to get it from the left side to the right side of that chart. Um, uh, uh, I read something that uh, um, someone said 30 to 40 percent of business analysts has just spent gathering, collecting the data, and I laughed at that because it's really like 70 or 80. All right, but you know, it's it, it, it's it's yeah. Uh, so to that person's question, Kelly, I don't know if you agree or not. Uh, if you don't, please expand or or, or reinforce it. But I, you know, we're overlooking the hard stuff a lot of mm -hmm. times. Yep. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see here. Um, someone said uh, this is some of the editorial comments, which are worth sharing for the chart uh, as to what to buy on a chart. Just throw a dart at it and buy wherever the dart lands. I, that I don't know. There might be some merit to that. We would like to. <laughs> about that. Uh, there's been several comments, uh, Kelly, this is something to reflect on because you've been in this industry uh, a while too with in data intensive things. We're repeating ourselves right now. And big data reach, has reached a point where we can step back and say, Hi, here's what's working, here's what's not working. Mm -hmm. And we're repeating ourselves on a lot of this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that that it is, it is a learning process, and that's okay. And I think that we are, you know, but, but what we've learned in the past, we also need to start applying. I think one of the comments uh, that were, was also made earlier is uh, that, that these pictures and this discussion sounds a lot like data warehousing in the 90s. And I think we do need to recognize that history can repeat itself. And are we remembering that and learning from it? And like I said, failing fast and moving on rather than continuing to spin our cycles and drive up costs, um, you know, which are bad for organizations, but good for software companies. Yeah. And now, consultants now, by that way, <laughs> by the oh, way. Yeah, exactly, exactly yes. Um, so here's the caveat with that. Um, there is a tendency to say, well, we've said this all before, so this is the same. And, and be careful, because that's not true. Remember, big data has gone mainstream. There's a rock group, all right? There is a way. There are commercials on television in prime time where people are talking to Watson. And, and, and when I was coming up into the workforce, uh, my, my view of that was HAL, and HAL was, 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 was not a nice computer, okay, um, in, you know, 2001, A Space Odyssey. So, um, so there is a real... Uh, um, uh, there's a difference here, but now that said, um, when we say that these problems are the same, it's not that big data is the same as early uh, instantiations of data warehouse. What is the same is the business still needs to have some help from data to solve problems. Business hasn't changed their requirement or their request for data assistance in 40 years. Simple, plain and simple. Since Data Warehouse started, we're now looking at almost 30 years of Data Warehouse. Before that, it was decision support. We had, before predictive analytics, we had data mining, all right? Um, uh, and it was, you know, creating answers to questions you haven't asked yet. And, and that was all over the advertisements. So what has not changed, and that is why these success factors keep coming up, is the technology has ignored. And this is what we're telling you is the bottom line of our presentation here today. Don't ignore 
using business language and solving the business problem and addressing that. The technology is changing. We're seeing a lot of uh, adjustment to, to where the demand and the market and the attention is, which is on the users of information. But that's why. It's not that this is the same. It's not that we're making the same mistakes. Uh, it's that we still haven't solved the problem that we promised to solve uh, in a cruder uh, function 30 years ago, but we are still talking about a lot of the same problems. Now, in addition to that, we're talking about a bunch of new stuff with Internet of Things and much more uh, shorter half-life data and much lower latencies, et cetera, like that. We didn't have the web 40 years ago, but, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's the same here. Uh, I'm going to let Kelly wrap up with her comments, and then we're going to turn it back over to our, to our host, Shannon, here. Kelly, anything to add? No, I think that's well said. I think that's well said. You've agreed with me with everything today. This is probably, uh, we're <laughs> going to have to do something more controversial. Um, uh, Shannon, I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, uh, 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 there are some some more editorial comments on on this, um, and um, but uh, we kind of capped on those. And let's see, hold on, I, there's maybe, is there one more here? Um, there's one, I don't know if I can answer this. Kelly, um, are there bigger data projects in the world than DBpedia and the emerging Wikipedia project? Do you consider DBpedia to be successful? What, what are we learning from Wikipedia organization that can be replicated and produced by smaller big data projects? Is that um, something you've thought about? I, 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 I could, Talk out loud. We don't have the time. Is that something that you've you've uh, you've considered? I don't think that I'm the best person to say what's the biggest big data project in in the world. Um, and I could only imagine that it probably has something to do with governments. Well, well, there is that part too, and that. <laughs> <laughs> and on that bombshell, to quote somebody who no longer who no longer has a job. Um, uh, 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 I will turn it back over. Well, I'm sorry, one more just came in. How do you envision defeating the catch-22 of workforce that does not have enough experience? That's a good question. Uh, I'll give my 15 seconds. Kelly, you can give your 15 seconds. Uh, when this has happened before, happened in the early 80s, happened in the mid-90s, uh, you train them. You hire them and you train them and then you create a workforce where hopefully you keep a fifth of them and the other 80% go work for somebody else, hopefully not your competitor. Kelly, what, what do you think uh, about getting around the catch-22? Well, I, I think that, that it ultimately goes in cycles and kind of solves itself in the sense that uh, in the technology world, the the universities always have been playing catch-up and the, and the academic institutions are always playing catch-up. So it's no different here. The good news is, is they are playing catch-up, right, and that they are ultimately getting to um, to a, a state where they are uh, training people to be very active once they get out of the um, educational institution. I mean, I, we, I had dinner last night with our intern that we brought on board, and she's uh, getting a master's in analytics. And one of the things that she was saying is that it's nice to do an internship because what you learn in the classroom is very conceptual, and it's not really clear how it can be applied. I thought that was really yep. telling, right? So we are still yep. learning as we are doing. And there's nothing wrong with that. It just means that we uh -huh. need to recognize that. And John, just like you said, as we train these, you know, highly fantastic, highly paid people, we need to think about retention plans or they will go work for our competitors. Absolutely, absolutely. I hope that helped whoever answered that. Um, uh, well, they just said thank you. I, I do so love <laughs> you. <welcome. laughs> And you're most welcome. Uh, Shannon, we're back September 1st, and uh, we'll be having an interview uh, with a CDO uh, yet to be determined. Uh, Shannon, we'll hand it back over to you for a wrap-up and move on. Thank you, John and Kelly, for another great presentation, as always. Uh, just a reminder, I will be sending out a follow-up email within two business days, so by end of day Monday for this webinar, with links to the slides, the recording of the session, and um, 
also will be selecting some winners to attend Enterprise Data Diversity um, September 19th through 22nd in Chicago, and you can meet John and Kelly in person. Uh, I'll also be there as well. Uh, I love seeing all the familiar people on the on the uh, webinar as well. Uh, thanks to everyone for, for participating in everything that we do and for all the great Q&A here. Uh, so that's about it. I hope everyone has a great day. John and Kelly, again, thank you so much for the time, and we'll see you all uh, next in September. Thank you Thank all. You. Thanks. Bye -bye.